Hello, every brony. Uh, nice to, well, not exactly see you. I don't see you, but uh, you can um, see me. And I've been looking forward uh, to this for a while to um, hold today's presentation about unicorns and uh, other fable equines. Um, but first, a little introduction. Uh, my name is Malte, and um, I've been holding this presentation uh, before as part of my job. I'm teaching uh, history and mythology in uh, some education uh, centers over here in Germany. And uh, in this particular case, I could really uh, combine the job with a hobby, so to speak, um, when holding, uh, when making unicorns and other fable equines uh, the topic of the presentation. And uh, the thing is, most of us uh, are rather familiar with modern day unicorns in popular culture, which will be part of the presentation. But a uh, few of us have ever uh, studied the source material, if you will, what people in the past uh, thought about unicorns, what they wrote about unicorns, basically about the history of um, the myth. Um, I'm talking so much about unicorns here because uh, they will be the main focus of the presentation. But um, as the title suggests, other fable equines will also got, uh, get their share, whether we are talking of pegasi uh, or pegasoi, depending on how you build the plural, or numerous others. But let me start with a little um, quote from one of the sources uh, I uh, uh, I read for this presentation. Um, by the way, it is a German source in that case. I translated it as good as I um, could, uh, as literal as I could. Uh, most For most of the source material, I also found um, English translations. Whenever um, that was not the case, I will point that out. So any mistake in the translation uh, would be blame uh, would be my blame. But what um, the, uh, was written in this book about unicorns was the following sentence. Pretty much exactly 2,400 years later, on September 12, 2001, Professor Dr. Herbert Hagen, who had intensively studied this fable animal, um, called the unicorn a fable animal which could not be harmed even by the sharpest mind. This was at a presentation at the Paleontological Museum in Munich. So what? Well, did you notice the date? September 12th, 2001. Well, that's some unicorn enthusiasm there for most of uh, most people in the world would have been preoccupied with events of the previous day uh, on September 12th, 2001. That's an, a hardcore case of unicorn enthusiasm. If you think about it, that a group of people got together in Munich uh, on that day to discuss uh, unicorns on a scientific uh, level. Okay, so much about unicorn enthusiasm even before the existence of, the, uh, of uh, much of the brony fandom. Um, and what I'm going to do next is uh, I start uh, giving a little insight on the history of humans and horses in general and how horses or fable horses uh, came to enter human mythology. Then there will be a large part about uh, unicorns and then parts about air-based, airborne or uh, sea-based uh, fable equines um, as well as, uh, well, godly horses in different human uh, mythologies uh, around the world. And in the end, I will uh, return basically to where we are starting right now, namely with uh, modern day pop culture, um, unicorns and other fable ponies. So let's start with the history of humans and the horse. The thing is that um, they share a very long uh, history. Um, horses are present uh, among the oldest surviving pieces of uh, art made uh, by humans, which we still have today. We see an example here. Um, this uh, carving from a mammoth uh, tusk was found in the uh, Vogelherdhöhle. That's a cave in the Swabian uh, Jura. And it's about uh, 32,000 uh, 32, years old. Um, so it is one of the oldest pieces of human art still existing. And um, well, it depicts a horse at a time when horses were mainly food for humans, for it took many more, many millennia more before humans actually started uh, to ride uh, horses. Um, and uh, well, in some, 
places uh, horse meat uh, is uh, still served uh, today. But um, again, it is, it is uncertain at what time uh, humans first started uh, to domesticate horses rather than just hunt them and use them for the purpose of riding uh, for the first time. The best estimates assume that it was at a time of about uh, 4,000, uh, sorry, 5,500 years ago, somewhere in Eurasia, but we don't know uh, for certain. What we do know for certain is that, that uh, horses, even before then, had gained uh, major importance uh, for human life uh, because uh, there were, are so many depictions of uh, horses uh, in early human art. The, uh, the example down below is much younger than the one above. That's the Uffington White Horse in Oxfordshire, uh, which was um, created about a thousand years before uh, our uh, time. And well, uh, before Christ, I mean, um, well, and it's a hill figure. Uh, uh, they dug trenches there, filled it with uh, white chalk, and this horse is uh, 107 meters long and 37 meters uh, high. So, yeah, we should do this at a uh, meetup. Uh, chalk drawing uh, of My Little Pony characters in that uh, size. And back to some older pieces of art, the ones, the earliest art, which is sometimes rather in a nickname fashion rather than a scientific statement uh, referred to as unicorns. For these, this one and this one, these are cave drawings uh, from France, from the famous case, uh, cave of La Soule. I hope I pronounced it correctly. Um, those cave drawings are 19,000 years old. And the scientists uh, nicknamed uh, these drawings uh, unicorns. I mean, the one above, seems to sport two horns and the one below, it's not really sure if uh, that's intentional, if that's meant to be a horn on the forehead of uh, that horse. Uh, in any case, we don't have any um, solid evidence of any form of unicorn mythology um, existing at that uh, time. Um, one can only speculate about uh, legends passed uh, orally over the generations, uh, but if, there was anything like that, it remains uh, shrouded in the uh, mists of history. And for that very uh, reason, it is also uh, rather unlikely um, that unicorns were uh, based on uh, real animals which uh, used to exist, like this one, the Elasmotherium. Um, that's a um, unicorn from uh, the Ice Age. Recently, um, scientific um, discoveries, well, paleontological discoveries uh, have um, made uh, have, have proven that these animals existed longer than previously assumed before uh, the uh, assumption had been that they had died out like 30,000 years ago or so. And uh, recent findings uh, show that they have existed much longer. Still, it is very debatable, very questionable, uh, questionable if um, there's any uh, oral tradition about these uh, animals seen uh, to be seen as a basis for unicorn uh, myths. In any case, um, there's one thing that uh, differs unicorns from most, uh, from many other um, mythological creatures, for example, dragons, uh, for uh, unicorns as such would not be a violation of the laws of nature. Something like a unicorn could exist on our uh, planet uh, in accordance with the laws of physics. Not so in case of dragons who, at least uh, in the way uh, they are usually depicted, uh, would be way too heavy to fly. And um, there are no real examples of anything comparable uh, to uh, dragons, but um, in real life. Uh, given the size and uh, size weight ra ratio and their ability to fly. But before I slip into the wrong presentation, let's get back to the unicorns. Um, something like a unicorn would be unusual in our um, in our world because most animals who come with horns uh, sport horns in symmetrical pairs on both sides of uh, the head. That's the case. With uh, the on uh, with the family bovidae, that is antelopes, cattle, sheep, goats, etc. They um, have horns on both uh, sides, and um, the uh, and the uh, the same goes for the cavidae. That's basically the family of deer, 
animals, uh, deer, uh, sport their antlers, which consist of bone, while in case of the bovidae, um, the horns are made of uh, keratin, which is the same material, material as we have, uh, for example, in our uh, fingernails. There are cases, however, of animals such as uh, uh, Elasmotarium with just uh, one horn and uh, one real animal, which may have inspired um, some of the unicorn legends, uh, was the Indi uh, Indian rhino, the Indian rhinoceros, rhinoceros unicornis, as it is uh, called in Latin, because it sports only one uh, single uh, horn, uh, but their horn um, is, uh, is um, comes without a core of bone, unlike in case of uh, most of the um, other bovidae. Anyway, so much about the biology. But it's not only biology that brought about some uh, unicorn uh, legends and unicorn myths. In some, case, uh, in some cases, something was lost or rather found in translation. And uh, therefore, let me let me talk a bit about the Bible, so to speak. For the Bible is one of the early literary sources in which unicorns are mentioned, or rather, no, they are not mentioned. But translations of the Bible have brought uh, have kind of canonized um, unicorns uh, in the Bible. What we see here on the, uh, the, this mosaic is an animal which in the original Bible texts is referred to in old Hebrew language as a re-em. Um, this mosaic, by the way, was made in uh, 1213 in a church in Ravenna. And uh, the re-em is an animal uh, which is mentioned several times uh, in uh, the Bible. Uh, for example, in uh, Job, uh, Job I'm, I'm sorry if I butcher the pronunciation here, uh, 39, uh, and lines uh, 9 to 12 in the King James uh, version of the Bible. I'm going to read that passage in a moment. But first, uh, let me tell you what uh, they turned the ram into during the translation. For, uh, it is almost certain that the ram was uh, meant to refer to, an, to what we would call an our ox or an oryx. An our ox was a kind of a wild, um, oxen, which was pretty much untamable. That species uh, died out um, th uh, hundreds of years ago. And the other animal, uh, the oryx, which may also um, be the origin of the ram, that's a uh, moment, no, sorry, the image comes later. The oryx is a kind of antelope, uh, who, which may also uh, be an uh, a pattern for later unicorn myth. However, uh, when the Bible was translated from Old Hebrew to Greek, there were two different ways of uh, translating uh, the re'em. One was monoceros and the other was rhinoceros, rhino basically. But that um, Greek texts were then translated to Latin. And in Latin, the rhinoceros was, taunt, uh, was turned into a unicornus. And you can already hear it, the Latin text unicornus, that, that was, of course, turned into unicorn in, uh, the, uh, in the Bible translations. And now I'm going to read the passage uh, of Job uh, 39, 9 to 12 in the King James Version of the Bible. There it says, will the Will the unicorn be willing to serve thee or abide by thy crib? Canst thou bind the unicorn with uh, his band in the furrow? Or will he harrow the valleys after thee? Wilt thou trust, uh, trust uh, him because his strength is great? Or wilt thou leave thy labor to him? Wilt thou believe him that he will bring home thy seed and gather it into thy barn? Um, there are several more uh, mentions of the um, ram of the unicorn in the Bible. The main point uh, the Bible makes is that the unicorn is untamable. And that suggests uh, that then an aurox or an oryx uh, was actually uh, meant by this. So here is an 
example of a depiction of what may be an aurochs. This is from the Indus culture from India, um, which is, and this depiction is sometimes also interpreted as a unicorn. However, as you can see, this is a um, sideway image. If there is a second horn, it would be covered, um, it would be out of sight covered uh, by the uh, first horn. So this is not exactly a very uh, solid evidence for a unicorn depiction in India. And here we have an image of an oryx, an animal, I mentioned it before, an antelope, which may have given rise to some of the unicorn myths, which may be the um, the Re'em from the Bible. We definitely know that the Egyptians tried uh, to domesticate the oryx and they failed totally, it didn't work out to domesticate this animal, which would have been rather um, beneficial because it is very resilient to um, desert uh, climate but it just didn't work out. And therefore it may uh, also have been the uh, Re'em from the Bible. Also, uh, since these animals are rather shy, you uh, can uh, you will often see them from the distance only. So it may be tricky to, uh, may, uh, to see that there are actually two horns. And in some cases, it may be only one. For in case uh, one of the horns uh, breaks uh, off, it doesn't regrow, so you may come across an oryx like this. And during the time of the Crusades, it is quite probable that Crusaders saw such animals from the distance with flaringly hot air. And this too may have supported the already existing unicorn uh, myths at the time. However, so far I have uh, only shown you some uh, pictures as source material for unicorn myths. So let's uh, get down to actual texts about uh, literary sources, which um, mention unicorns and which describe them in a way, <laughs> in the way uh, the unicorn is depicted here, not exactly the My Little Pony type of unicorn, but the first written mention of a unicorn um, is by the Greek physician and uh, historian Ctesias of Cnidus, uh, who lived in the 5th and 4th uh, century BC. And around 400 BC, he wrote uh, the book Indica, uh, in which he came up with some facts, but also a lot of wild yarns and myths about India. So um, he describes uh, animals who, which really exist, but he also describes people without heads who have their, fa uh, have their faces on their chests or people with huge feet, which they use as umbrellas and uh, people with dogs heads who can only bark and not uh, talk, that kind of stuff. And in that book, we also have the first um, mention of uh, unicorns. Uh, so it may not be an actual, uh, a very reliable source. Uh, and Ctesias doesn't uh, claim to have seen a unicorn uh, himself, uh, but uh, it is something that he seems to have heard. It is possible that an Indian rhino uh, was the basis uh, for what he describes. But now I'm quoting what he wrote, of course, a translation, because I don't know um, ancient Greek, but this is uh, what Ctesias wrote about them. Wild donkeys as large as horses or even larger. Their bodies are white, their heads um, of a dark red, the eyes of a dark blue. In the middle of their forehead, they have a horn of one cubit, that would be about 45 centimeters. The stem of this horn uh, is white as snow. The upper part is pointy and of shining red color. The middle section is black. Humans who drink from these horns, for drinking vessels are being made of it, are allegedly uh, protected from all poisons if they drink wine, water, or anything else uh, from such a vessel before or after taking any poison. This animal is extraordinarily fast and strong, so no other, not even the horse, can overwhelm it. There is only one way to confront them in a hunt. If many riders surround them while they, uh, well, Sorry, while they lead their cubs to the grazing ground, they won't flee because they don't uh, want to abandon their cubs. In a fight, they step with their horns, they kick, bite, and lash out against uh, horses and riders. In the end, they are slain with arrows and spears, for it is impossible to catch them alive. That's the first uh, source mentioning, uh, explicitly mentioning unicorns. 
And we have another one from that time. Uh, it's a very similar book by the, uh, about India by a Greek diplomat and historian, Megasthenes, who lived about 350 before Christ to 290 before Christ. Um, and he actually did travel to India. You know, it was a time of Alexander the Great. So more Greek, uh, Greeks and Macedonians traveled to traveled to India than ever before. And it is quite probable uh, that Megasthenes uh, was among them. And uh, in 303 BC, he described the unicorn. There is no surviving original of the text of uh, Megasthenes book, but other authors um, have quoted him. Among these other authors is Pliny the Elder, the most famous victim of the eruption of uh, the Vesuvius in uh, 79 AD. You know the eruption that destroyed uh, Pompeii. And in any case, um, he quoted uh, the passage uh, of the unicorns, uh, which um, in which he referred to the unicorn as a uh, monoceros. And um, we can take it almost for granted that the basis for this description was uh, the Indian rhino. In any case, what um, was written there was the monoceros, an animal with the body of a horse, the head of a deer, the feet of an elephant, as seen in this picture, and it, the tail of a boar. Its roar is low pitched. It has a single black horn in the middle of its forehead, which measures two cupids. So by now the horn is some 90 centimeters long. It is said that it is impossible to catch this animal alive. And I'm going to give you a third uh, source from the ancient uh, days about uh, unicorns. And in this case, you will have probably heard about uh, the author before. He is a most famous uh, reformer of calendars of all time. And he also had side jobs in the military and in politics. His name was Julius Caesar. And in his book about the Gallic War, uh, the Bello Gallico, book six, uh, the, uh, chapter 26, lines uh, one to three, uh, he writes, there is an ox of the shape of a stack between whose ears a horn rises from the middle of the forehead, higher and straighter than those horns which are known to us. From the top of this, branches like uh, palms stretch out a considerable distance. The shape of the female and the male is the same. The appearance and the size of the horn, uh, horns is the same. So here we have uh, the first reference uh, to unicorns not based in India, because um, Julius Caesar refers the animals allegedly uh, living on the other side of the Rhine, so basically in uh, Germany and Eastern uh, Europe. And there's one last um, literal source from uh, the ancient times, which I'm going to mention to you, because it um, sort of uh, it um, adds a, an important point to the description of unicorns, which uh, we can still see in unicorn depictions uh, today. Uh, the um, author is a guy named Claudius Arianos. He's often just uh, referred to as Aelian. And he lived from 170 to 222 um, AD. And um, he, uh, on the one hand, well, I'll first read the source. Uh, the horn is smooth, but has spirals grown uh, naturally, naturally into it. It is black in the middle section. It is said that the Indians are drinking from this multicolored horn. It is said that a human who has drunk from it is protected from any incurable diseases, will never have cramps and is immune to poison. It loves solitary grazing grounds where it is wandering around on its own. But during mating season, when it's partners, uh, when it partners with a female, it will get sociable, and both animals are gra grazing alongside each other. There are two important points in this source by Aelian. On the one hand, he is the first to mention the spiral shape of the, of the unicorn horn, and we are going to see other um, materials, so to speak, uh, which may have been the basis for this uh, idea, um, namely the tusk of a narwhal. And uh, secondly, he also mentions that unicorns get sociable around female unicorns. And the idea of unicorns getting tame, social around females is something that uh, became very much uh, prominent in medieval depictions of unicorns. However, 
before I'm going to do, um, turn over to the Middle Ages and medieval hum, um, unicorn mythos, I'm going to summarize uh, some stuff that we get uh, from the four um, sources from antiquity, which I mentioned, from Catesias, Megasthenes, Julius Caesar, and Aelia. Um, they have all some things in common. Namely, first of all, none of the none of them talks of the unicorn as a creature from mythology or legend, but rather uh, something exotic from far away, something that exists in uh, real life, but in a country far away. But it is never suggested that it is an animal uh, just from uh, legends or mythos. And also, there are no ancient uh, legends or mythos in which uh, unicorns appear. Uh, there is no uh, story about uh, gods interacting with unicorns or ancient Greek heroes uh, riding unicorns or anything like this. Uh, unlike uh, creatures like Pegasus, uh, unicorns were simply seen as a real animal, just an animal living too far away for most people to ever uh, encounter them. The second uh, part that can be pointed out is that in these ancient uh, sources, unicorns are not linked exclusively to horses, but um, they are often um, compared to also to donkeys, to deer, and to goats. And parts of these associations with uh, animals other than horses uh, survive um, to these uh, days. For example, uh, even though today unicorns are mostly um, compared to or linked to uh, horses. Uh, there are still many depictions in which, for example, unicorns have a tail more like a donkey uh, rather than a horse uh, tail, even though the horse tail is common in My Little Pony, but there are still many depictions of, um, uh, un of unicorns with a tail with a tassel. That's a depiction, for example, in uh, the movie adaptation of The Last Unicorn. And there are also many depictions uh, with the um, unicorns uh, having uh, uh, having cloven hoofs like a goat rather than horse uh, hoofs. So some of these elements uh, still survive in many modern day unicorn depictions. And uh, last but not least, um, the thing that uh, three of the sources uh, mention is the detoxing effect of the horn. Uh, of the unicorns. And that's the only magical thing uh, linked to unicorns uh, at the time. So any idea of unicorns shooting laser or whatever from uh, their horns or doing other magic with it is a modern day uh, product which cannot be found uh, in ancient or even medieval uh, sources. The detoxing effect of the horn is the only magical thing mentioned. And it needn't even uh, be magical at all, for there can be a real basis for detoxing effect of horns, because um, uh, unfortunately to this uh, day, uh, rhino horns are sometimes um, you, uh, used to detox um, liquids. The thing is the keratin of the horn can have a mild filtering effect similar to that of activated uh, carbon um, that is used uh, in modern day medicine. Um, so uh, and so it, this may be the basis for the idea that uh, the horn of a unicorn could uh, take the uh, poison out of uh, any drink it uh, touches. Okay. Here, by the way, is a late medieval depiction by Albrecht Dürer of uh, rhino and uh, unicorn, still based uh, in terms of color on the uh, sources mentioned before. So we have reached the Middle Ages when it comes to source material. <laughs> and now things get uh, funny in a way because, uh, well, we are all unicorn or at least pony enthusiasts, I suppose. And so were many early Christians. For the unicorn, due to a translation error, as we have seen, had been sanctioned by the Bible. And some of the very early Christians saw the unicorn as a symbol for Jesus or God himself. And they got really very enthusiastic about them. Uh, I can mention only a few of the sources uh, we have there. 
but from the fourth century onward, uh, the unicorn was um, turned into a very, very Christian symbol. One of the most outspoken unicorn fans was uh, Saint Basil of Caesarea lived from 330 to 379. And he wrote, said about Christ that he was called, I'm quoting now, called the son of the unicorn, since the unicorn, as we can read in Job, are irresistible power and not subdued by humans. And at an, in a different source, he says, and Christ is the power of God, therefore he is called the unicorn, for the reason that he has a horn that is the joint power with his father. So really uh, get this, what St. Basil says is Jesus is a unicorn, which also means God is a unicorn. Wow, that's a degree of unicorn adoption, which even most brownies uh, wouldn't uh, follow, at least not in such an um, extremely religious uh, sense. As, uh, so this is about the highest praise to the unicorn, which one of these uh, early Christian saints uh, could give. And uh, people continue like this. For example, uh, Isidore of uh, Seville, uh, who lived from uh, 560 to 636, um, he uh, was a very famous uh, Christian author, and he wrote, among other physiologies, which are sometimes referred to as bestiaries uh, these days. They, those are books um, about real and imagined non-real animals, which are usually presented uh, in a rather allegorical form with uh, Christian messages included there. And one of the, uh, his uh, books uh, is um, surviving in uh, the, at the University of Cambridge. It's called The Rochester Bestiary. And this book uh, says the following about unicorns. The unicorn, which is also called rhinoceros by the Greeks, has this nature. A small animal and similar to a kid, kid as in uh, a young goat, very fierce, having one horn in the middle of the forehead and no hunter is able to capture it. But by this series of events, it is kept, uh, captured. A virgin girl is led where it lives and is left there alone in the woods. And as soon as it sees her, it leaps into her lap and embraces her and thus is seized. And thus our Lord Jesus Christ is spiritually the unicorn, which is, is uh, said and uh, <coughs> about which it is said, and as the beloved son of uh, unicorns, and in another psalm, my horn shall be exalted like that of the unicorn, so he's quoting other sources there, and in Zacharias, um, and I shall rise up the, um, an horn of salvation to use in the house of David, the, uh, his servant, further the creature with one horn signifies that which, that which he himself said, and I, the father, are one. And according to the apostle, the head of Christ is God. They say it is very fierce because neither principalities nor powers nor thrones nor dominions could understand him, nor could uh, he, he hold him, nor the uh, keenest devil be able to understand him or track him, but only the will of the father did uh, he descend into the womb of a virgin for our salvation. It is called this, um, a small animal, an account of the humility of incar um, incarnation, as it, is, uh, as it is said, learn of me because I am meek and humble of heart. The unicorn is similar to a kid, and because the, sa um, because the Savior was made in the likeness of sinful flesh and of sin, he hath condemned the sin, not the sinner. The unicorn often fights with elephants and uh, casts them down, wounded in the stomach. Well, it continues uh, like this, but I think we have the, um, we get the gist. Unicorns are extremely en vogue for early Christians. Here we uh, have um, also, on the one hand, a rather small unicorn, as also seen in this medieval time picture. The unicorn is smaller than a horse by now, um, often compared uh, to a young goat, a uh, kid. And it, uh, on the other hand, it apparently can also fight uh, elephants. So in the Middle Ages, unicorns are the, uh, often um, used as symbols for quite a number of things and sometimes even contradicting things. They are a symbol for both matrimony and virginity. Here we have a depiction uh, with a scene 
from uh, the story of uh, Tristan and, and I sold. I hope I get the English pronunciation right. Please bear with me if you don't, if I can answer any questions uh, later on. Uh, we, on the, uh, the story is that um, Tristan has basically an affair with Isolde, whom he loves, but she is already uh, married to um, King Meinke. And you see on the left side of the box how Meinke uh, uh, well, observes them from the trees, so basically caught them in the act while they see the mirrored image of the king in the water. And compared to this act of treason or uh, uh, getting caught, we see on the right hand how a unicorn gets murdered after being uh, lured into the trap by a virgin. Oh, by the way, there are also medieval um, sources which um, point out that the unicorn will kill a woman uh, if the woman doesn't happen to be a virgin. Well strange. In any case, uh, the unicorn is seen as both a symbol for matrimony and on the other hand for virginity. And there are quite a few uh, medieval depictions of unicorns being uh, captured by virgins in the Middle Ages. Here's another example. And uh, most of the time we also uh, see the unicorn uh, being killed in uh, the process. Here's another example. This uh, is one picture in a series of uh, quite a few, um, uh, which were created in the 15th century, in which uh, there is a unicorn hunt. Here we have the scene where the uh, hunters find uh, the unicorn, and uh, other depictions uh, show how the unicorn is hunted and uh, killed. And there's also an alternative ending for there's also one picture in which uh, the unicorn is actually uh, captured alive. There are some details in this image uh, which are interesting, namely on the one hand that there are wild animals, including lions, near the unicorn, but none of them will do anything to the unicorn. And we also see that the unicorn is touching the water with a horn. We remember the touch of the unicorn's horn will remove any poison from the water. And that's uh, something with, uh, that is very often uh, seen in medieval depictions that a unicorn touches the water with a horn. Here's another example, and thereby it uh, makes the water uh, drinkable. Oh, funny detail, by the way, in this uh, picture, you also see a beaver in the background with a fish for a tail, for the beaver was declared to be a fish in the Middle, uh, in the middle Ages, uh, which had culinary reasons, so to speak, because during the time of feasting, no meat, uh, was permitted to be eaten, but by declaring uh, the beaver a fish, um, the, uh, the monks uh, in monasteries were allowed to eat beaver meat. So, yeah, so much about that. So here we have a unicorn horn. <laughs> well, or rather the, the uh, unicorn horn was a very important trade good in the Middle Ages. Um, and there's one interesting uh, thing. Uh, there is a word for just the horn of a unicorn or rather the substance of the horn. For it was called Einkhörn in German and the Latin word for it was alicorn. So the name My Little Pony gave to winged unicorns essentially was originally a word used uh, for the substance of unicorn horn. And this substance could be, well, well, it, it was so expensive, uh, you could basically sell it for its weight in gold or more because of uh, its uh, use as uh, to detox uh, anything or because of the claim that anything touched with a unicorn horn, with alicorn, uh, would uh, no longer be poisonous to whoever consumes it. And uh, this is something that was of great interest uh, to medieval lords and ladies because poison is a very elegant and, uh, well, usable way to get rid of political enemies. So um, many uh, lords would pay a big buck for um, unicorn horn. And there were people who provided this mostly from Scandinavia, because most of you will know what this unicorn horn really is. This example, by the way, is uh, exhibited in Vienna today because it's uh, part of the crown jewels of the Holy Roman uh, Empire um, at the time and now exhibited in Vienna. 
The origin of this is, of course, the name narwhal. It's not actually a horn, but a tusk. Uh, which these animals sport. And uh, it is quite likely uh, that such um, tusks have uh, been the basis uh, for the description of unicorn horns as spiral uh, shaped. It is quite probable that uh, I learned the that um, author I mentioned before had uh, seen or at least um, ge been given the description of a narwhal tusk for sometimes uh, such narwhals uh, stranded or corpses of narwhals stranded. So such tusks would have been available. And in the Middle Ages, narwhals were deliberately uh, hunted, uh, especially by um, sailors from uh, Scandinavia, who then sold these tusks as a uh, unicorn horn for huge uh, sums. There's another animal whose tusks were also uh, sold as unicorn horns, namely walruses, maybe a basis for unicorn depictions with a slightly curved uh, horn, who knows. But um, the thing is uh, that such tableware with unicorn uh, horn in it would, of course, not literally um, detox anything in it. If you drink poison from that cup, you will die. However, nevertheless, this may have been a very eff effective uh, way to prevent um, assassination attempts uh, via poison, because if it was well known that a lord or a lady, whoever, uh, had such unicorn tableware, um, the Lord of, uh, and the Lady would definitely make sure that everyone knew about this. For if it was known that the Lord or the Lady had this, then people wouldn't even go so far as to give a poison um, poisoning attempt a try, because it wouldn't work anyway in the belief of the time. And uh, this belief that unicorn horn uh, would um, would make poison ineffective uh, continued until the time. Uh, of the French Revolution, actually. However, there had been some tests uh, with uh, not so lucky outcome uh, comes. At least uh, there is a story about King James the First of England, um, who was also King James the Fourth of Scotland, the first king who ruled both kingdoms, and uh, he is said to have given a servant poison mixed with unicorn horn powder, which he had bought. And after the servant died, the king complained. Uh, that uh, he had been deceived. Unfortunately, none of the books I consulted said anything about the reaction of uh, the relatives of the poor servant uh, who died there. Um, well, uh, but uh, the belief in uh, the in the um, effectiveness of a unicorn horn against poison can still be found uh, to this day in Germany sometimes for many of the drugstores, uh, drugstores as in pharmacies over here in Germany, are called Einhorn Apotheke, which means unicorn apothecary. It's one of the most uh, frequent name of um, drugstores over here. But um, sometimes unicorn horn has also been used for furniture, as in case of the unicorn throne of Denmark in the 16th century. Uh, it was made in the 16th century. It uh, exists still today. However, people in the Middle Ages um, and the early modern days, they, they were not stupid. And they came to realize well, wait a moment, why is it that all the unicorn horns seem to come from the sailors, from the sea? That's kind of weird. Is it actually really unicorn horns? Well, and all of a sudden, many depictions of swimming unicorns appeared, fishtailed unicorns, and so the commercial success of unicorn horn uh, continued even after people figured out that... Um, the origin of uh, these unicorn horns uh, was not uh, to be uh, found uh, on land. So, uh, uh, the belief that unicorns act were actual real animals existing somewhere in the world, but not in the part of the world where people were talking about them, uh, continued till far into the 19th century. In the 19th century, there were attempts to locate uh, unicorns in uh, Tibet, um, 
but uh, and but uh, unlike uh, and because unlike dragons, uh, unicorns could theoretically exist um, in accordance with the laws of nature. Um, the belief in the belief in unicorns persisted longer than the belief in uh, dragons. But as the uncharted areas of the world uh, ceased, uh, so did the belief in unicorns as a real uh, species. Okay. Oh, here, one more depiction about a unicorn from uh, the late Middle Ages, in which uh, case the unicorn also has kind of a lion's uh, mane. And we also see it's called a uh, monoceros here. So basically a monoceros, one of the other Latin uh, terms for it. So, so much about unicorns for the time being, but it is also, this presentation is also about other fable equines. So let's talk about Pegasus and other airborne uh, horses from mythology. Pegasus uh, is uh, originally not a species, but a single individual. The Pegasus um, is a single uh, creature and unlike unicorns, it is never, uh, the Pegasus is never depicted as a real uh, species in uh, Greek mythology, but there is the, um, the uh, but it is a, a creature uh, who, that appears in uh, Greek mythology, uh, namely in two um, stories in particular. One is a, a story about uh, Perseus, I hope I pronounce him correct in English, Perseus. That is the guy who uh, killed the Gorgo Medusa, the lady with the snakes on the head, uh, which, uh, whose, uh, the view of who would uh, turn you into stone. And um, according to the legend, when uh, Perseus beheaded uh, Medusa, um, from the um, neck of Medusa uh, sprung Pegasus, the winged horse, and also a guy, a warrior named Krusawa, who appears later on in um, Hercules uh, stories. But uh, the, um, those two sprang from the neck of uh, Medusa. Quite a grisly uh, start for the Pegasus. But um, here, but uh, Pegasus became extremely popular in uh, Greek. There are countless of depictions on uh, crates and uh, vases and uh, coins. But um, in the saga of uh, Perseus, he, uh, Pegasus doesn't really play a role, even though sometimes in the Renaissance age, uh, Pegasus has been depicted as a mount for uh, Perseus. Uh, but um, actually, in the Greek myth, in Greek mythology, somebody else was uh, the one to tame Pegasus and ride him, namely Bellerophon or Bellerophontes, with the assistance of the goddess Athena. You see her on the right. Um, he was able to the um, to um, put a bridle on uh, Pegasus and thereby tame uh, Pegasus. He needed Pegasus in order to fight another creature, which we know from My Little Pony, namely the Chimera, you know, with the lion's head and the snake uh, tail and the goat head. And in the uh, legend, um, Bellerophontes uh, fights the Ch Chimera from the back of uh, Pegasus, and uh, he uh, puts a lump of uh, lead to the tip of his spear and rams this down the throat of the chimera because the skin of the chimera is impenetrable. But when the chimera then tries to spit fire, as the chimera can, the lead melts and burns her from inside out. Yeah, mythology can be rather uh, cruel in that respect. But after that, uh, after that uh, quest was done, uh, Bellerophon has kept uh, Pegasus and proceeded to um, do many other uh, famous feats, but he became kind of arrogant about it and one day tried to reach Mons, uh, Mount Olympus, the home of the goddess, because he felt that he was good enough to become an immortal. Uh, Zeus thought different and sent a mosquito to sting Pegasus until Pegasus uh, threw off Bellerophontes and um, then Pegasus uh, flew away. So. Uh, with all that uh, being said, Pegasus was a single individual rather than a species in, um, the in myth and legend, but the idea of a winged horse became so popular 
So it was also uh, printed on coins that very soon uh, the um, Pegasus became, well, was basically turned into a species, which is kind of funny in, um, in a linguistic sense because Pegasus is a name. There is not really a plural to a name. To this day, we uh, linguists sometimes struggle to give a real Pegasus, uh, a real plural uh, to Pegasus. We are all um, uh, accustomed to say Pegasi, which would be based on Latin uh, Pegasus, Pegasi, while in Greek it would be Pegasoi, and uh, in other languages there uh, are cases like Pegasus or Pegasen. Anyway. Let's stick with the Pegasi of uh, My Little Pony here. And now let's move on to, well, to a part of the world which I kind of neglect uh, in this presentation. I apologize for that. But here we have one piece of art uh, which I want to show you from that region of the world. For this statue was uh, made in China uh, in the time of the Northern Wei Dynasty, that is um, the fifth century. And uh, here's one example uh, of a winged unicorn. There are similar depictions also from uh, from Europe in which a unicorn uh, um, has been also has uh, been given uh, wings. Um, and uh, as I as you all know, alicorn is a term in which is uh, in modern days uh, sometimes used uh, for a winged uh, unicorn due to because of my little pony sometimes uh, there is also the term pegacorn but there is no real official name for a winged unicorn at least nothing more official which um, uh, than uh, my little pony's uh, description well let's work on it let's make the term official <laughs> And um, speaking of China, um, many of you may wonder about the Kirin now, or rather the Kilin, if we are talking about the Chinese uh, version. Kirin is the uh, Japanese and Kilin, the um, Chinese uh, version. They are sometimes described as uh, the Chinese, respectively, Japanese version of a unicorn. But it is um, a somewhat difficult uh, comparison for while there are um, unicorn-like creatures in Chinese and um, uh, Japanese mythology, the Kirin are not necessarily the closest uh, to a unicorn. That would be a uh, Qi, um, which um, is kind of a Chinese uh, unicorn, which has more horse-like qualities than a Kirin or a Kilin, uh, because the Kilin are often, well, more of a chimeric uh, character. They usually have antler-shaped uh, horns, a lion's mane, and uh, scales, etc. Uh, so a horse is not really the main um, the main part of uh, Kirin uh, or Kilin. Therefore, I somewhat neglected uh, them in this presentation. Uh, please don't be mad at me for that. And now we talk about the Hippolectrian. Yeah. Uh, I couldn't help myself including this image here. You will get the joke if you see the depiction of the Hippolectrion, which is a creature from Greek mythology. Here we go. There's a funny thing about a Hippolectrion, for the Hippolectrion doesn't actually appear in myth and legends, and at least not in surviving myth of legend from ancient Greek times. Uh, but um, there are quite a few depictions of the Hippolectrion, a horse with the wings and a tail and rear end of a rooster. Uh, the Hippolectrion is very often uh, shown on Greek uh, pottery or in Greek uh, paintings or even sculptures. In the sixth century before Christ, um, there were Hippolectrian depictions pretty much everywhere. So they seem to have been extremely popular. But the weird thing is that uh, in written sources, we have very little reference to the uh, Hippolectrian and uh, the references we do have basically make fun of the idea of a Hippolectrian. For example, there is um, the, uh, an ancient Greek comedy play called The Frogs. Um, and in that play, a poet named Isisholos is being ridicul ridiculed for using the word Hippolectrion in one of his plays. And um, in this play, the poet is admonished uh, and told not to use words which would confuse even the gods. So. 
it's kind of strange that on the one hand, there were Hippolectrian depictions everywhere at the time, while at the same time, the word Hippolectrian seems to have escaped most of the Greek. Here's another sculpture of a Hippolectrian. Now let's talk about the youngest of the airborne ponies uh, today, um, at least the youngest uh, mentioned here. And it has also been present uh, in uh, My Little Pony already, namely the Hippogriff. The Hippogriff um, is basically an alternative version of uh, the griffin. The griffin uh, being an eagle's head on a lion's body and uh, with uh, eagle's wings. And in the uh, case of the Hippogriff, the lion's part uh, has been traded uh, for horse parts. And in case of this uh, creature, the Hippogriff, we actually know the inventor. For um, it is a rather modern uh, creation. Uh, but it has been invented by the Italian playwright Ludovico Ariosoto, uh, who lived from 1474 to 1533. And um, he wrote an epic story called Orlando Furioso. Uh, and the title hero, Orlando, uses a hippogriff to save uh, the princess Angelica from a sea monster. And there is another English prince in that play named Astolfo. Uh, he uses a hippogriff to fly even to the moon. Hippogriffs have been rather obscure for quite a while, and it is partly due to Harry Potter with Buckbeak in there that um, uh, that uh, hippogriffs uh, have become more of a household uh, term in uh, recent times again, uh, because they hadn't been as famous as the Pegasus, though arguably more famous nowadays than the Hippolectrian. Okay, let's talk about the sea ponies, about the hippocampus and kelpies, the water horses. The hippocampus, that's a Greek word, and yeah, that's a term also used for parts of the human brain, hippocampus, but in this case, it has nothing to do with the brain, but with a horse, uh, which, with a fish tail, a seahorse uh, with a fish tail and uh, very often with webbing instead of hooves. Um, it is uh, found in many antique uh, depictions where they very often accompany Poseidon, the god of the oceans. Um, Poseidon, by the way, was uh, very much linked to horses. He was the god of horses. Uh, horse was a symbol of Poseidon. He gave the Athenians the horse as a present, trying to basically make them adore him. Um, in any case, he is uh, very often depicted alongside uh, such uh, hippocampi. Uh, here we have a mosaic uh, from a Roman termi in Bath, so in England. Uh, and here's a more modern or a medieval depiction in which uh, the webbing instead of uh, hoof hoofs is uh, very easy uh, to recognize. And here we have a uh, also something that looks like a hippocampus, it may actually be a different kind of animal, but it's also from the British Isles, but from the other side of the Roman border, so to speak, for this is um, a Pictish uh, steel. Uh, so it's from Scotland. And there we have uh, the fish tailed horse and um, it may actually be an early depiction of what is depicted here in a modern depiction. Uh, and a good piece of advice for all of you who spend their holidays in Scotland, which is a good idea. It's a lovely country. It's a beautiful country. But if you come to a lake there or a river and then a friendly horse turns up and offers you to carry you on the, to the other side on the back, don't get on that horse. You may know this already if you have seen recent DuckTales episodes in which familiar sounding Kelpies appeared. Well, a Kelpie is the name of this kind of um, water spirit, of uh, lake spirit, which often turns up in the shape of a horse offering, offering travelers to carry uh, the travelers uh, on the other side of the lake or the river on the back. But anyone who mounts a Kelpie, Kelpie cannot get off the back anymore and will be drowned or devoured or drowned and devoured um, by, uh, the, by the Kelpie. Um, there are some stories which say that if you can 
put a bridle on the Kelpie, the Kelpie will get tame. And other stories uh, say quite the opposite, that if you can remove the bridle from a Kelpie, uh, it would get uh, tame. But in any case, there are safer means to cross uh, the water nowadays. So beware of horses bearing gifts. Oh, um, now that would be Troy. Anyway, uh, Greek bearing gifts. Okay, so, um, uh, oh, and uh, in case you haven't seen uh, the recent uh, DuckTales episodes, there are two Kelpies named Briar and Bramble, who sound very similar to certain ponies from My Little Pony, you know, Tara Strong and, uh, well, uh, your uh, names, sorry, the voice actress of um, Pinkie Pie and Fluttershy voice uh, the, those two. Oh yeah, here, here we go, there they are. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about human horses and, and godly horses. Oh, now things get a bit um, not safe for, for work if we are talking about kentors, uh, about centaurs. Are they pronounced kentors or centaurs in Greek? In any case, uh, in, in English, in any case, we are talking about the horse body with a human body on top. You know, Lord T-Rex is a kentor. And um, in uh, the in Greek mythology, the kentors are, well, very horny without having a horn, but uh, they are usually always after um, uh, after human uh, women. And uh, there is a reason for this, namely the reason for their existence. According to uh, Greek mythology, um, the very horny uh, Ixion king, uh, Ixion, who was a king of the Lapids, wanted to sexually harass Hera, the godmother, basically, and uh, she gave her own shape to a cloud. So the drunken Ixion raped the cloud, and that's how Kentors, centaurs, uh, came to the world. And uh, in, uh, uh, with this origin story, they usually uh, come across as unrestrained, conniving, and horny. Here's an example. Um, this uh, Kentaur on this um, crate is called Nessos. Uh, he wanted to abduct Dene uh, Neira, the wife of uh, Hercules, by the way, while crossing a river. So he did basically the Kelpie thing there. But um, Hercules killed him with his poisoned arrows. And then while dying, um, the uh, Kentaur Nessos uh, told Denera, the wife of Hercules, that he loved her so much she could should catch his blood. And if ever Hercules uh, should get uh, infidel to her, should um, sleep with other women, uh, she should use this blood and brush it on the inside of a shirt of Hercules. And if he would put it on, Hercules would be in love with her again because uh, his Nessos's own uh, love would uh, go to Hercules uh, then. And instead, uh, when Hercules put on that uh, shirt, uh, he died a very painful death for, for rather than the love uh, for Denera of Nessos. Uh, it was a poison of Hercules's own arrows, uh, which uh, then uh, killed him. There's one exception um, in Greek mythology, this uh, Kentaur. His name was Chiron, and he's actually the only not god mytholo mythological creature mentioned in the Iliad. You know, the story about the Trojan War. There are gods all over the place and other immortals, but uh, in the Iliad, there are not uh, any other fable animals like, uh, you, uh, like, um, Pegasi or other monsters, which we have in the uh, Odyssey, the stories about Ulysses' uh, journey home. Uh, but this one, uh, Centaur, is the only non-god um, non, um, creature, uh, mythological creature there. Uh, he's mentioned as a teacher to the young uh, Achilles. Here, as shown in this picture, and um, he's uh, also he also appears in uh, the. Uh, the saga of Hercules, in which he dies a very tragic and sometimes a very noble uh, death. So, well, the one good centaur, so to speak. I think there's one other good centaur in Greek mythology, but other than that, they are usually depicted as unrestrained and uh, horny and all that. 
Speaking of horny, uh, oh, um, yeah, they also have female uh, centaurs, at least in depictions uh, in the um, ancient uh, Roman and Greek uh, art, but uh, there, is no, there is no mention of female centaurs in uh, mythology at the time. Speaking of horny, that's another uh, story, this time from Norse mythology. There, uh, we are, if you look at this horse, you will find a strange strange thing about this horse. It has uh, some legs to, to many, eight legs in particular. For this horse is Sleipnir. Sleipnir is uh, the horse of Odin, the godfather in uh, North mythology. And the origin story of this uh, horse is as follows. The uh, frost giant, a Jotun, offered the gods to build a wall around their um, their fortress of Asgard, which would be too uh, strong and too high for even the giants to get past. And the gods, always anticipating Ragnarok, the last battle, were eager to um, have this war. But the frost giant demanded the goddess Freya as a wife in um, as, uh, as a payment. And the gods agreed to this on the condition that the wall had to be completed within six months, to which the giant agreed on the condition that uh, his stallion Swadilfari uh, could help with building the wall. And uh, shortly before the walls were completed, within five months, uh, the god Loki took the form of a mare in heat, uh, luring Swadilfari away uh, and thereby preventing the completion of the wall. And uh, well, apparently Swadilfari and Loki had a good time. Uh, in any case, Loki gave birth to Swadilfari, uh, to, not Swadilfari, to Sleipnir, um, the horse he then gave to his father, Odin. The name Sleipnir, by the way, means uh, the slipper, not as in the shoe, but something that slides slippy um, because uh, this horse Sleipnir could walk on land and uh, through the air and uh, on water. So a horse for uh, all places, water, air and, um, and uh, the solid ground. But so far, most of the stories we had were of um, Western origin, but uh, there are fable equines, uh, religious um, fable equines, one could say, in Islamic uh, tradition as well. Meet the Burak or Al-Burak. Um, Al-Burak is a horse-like being with a human head and wings, so a bit like a mixture of a pegasus uh, and a kentaur. And according to Islamic uh, tradition, um, this uh, very proud animal uh, was given to the prophet Muhammad and brought him to the heavens and back within one night and in another night uh, from Mecca to Jerusalem. Um, and in one story, it is said that uh, the Burak was too proud to let Mohammed uh, ride on him until the archangel Gabriel told um, the Burak that uh, Mohammed had been chosen by Allah, God himself. And um, then, then the Al Burak permitted uh, this. And in uh, Jerusalem, uh, at the Temple Mount, there is a wall uh, to which, according to legend, um, Muhammad uh, tied um, the Al Burak to a ring at the wall. And uh, therefore, um, there's a, a mosque today, a mosque, uh, I'm, well, uh, a mosque uh, which is called the Al Burak Mosque. Uh, the name uh, Burak, by the way, um, has different uh, translations, and funnily enough, some of the names sound very My Little Pony-like. Uh, for if you go for an Arabian translation of the name, uh, Burak could mean something along the lines of beam, flash, gleam, glimmer, glisten, glitter, radiate, shimmer, shine, sparkle, twinkle. All of this, uh, these are words that have been suggested as a translation for Al Burak. It sounds like a name dictionary from My Little Pony, basically. Uh, but there can also be a Middle Persian interpretation of the name, in which case it would simply mean riding beast or mount. Here's also a Philippine uh, depiction of uh, the Al Burak, uh, so a piece of art from the Pacific uh, region of the world. 
Okay, we have had quite a few examples of mythological horses by now, but now we are reaching modern days, modern times, for um, and we are returning especially to the unicorns uh, again, because uh, as uh, mentioned before, unicorns haven't really been creatures of a lot of mythology. I mean, all we have is uh, the, the uh, descriptions of how a unicorn can be captured by a virgin, and that's basically it. There are, unlike in case of dragons, no real stories in which a unicorn appears as an individual in the Middle Ages or in uh, ancient times. And that's something that uh, came to pass in um, modern days, so to speak, especially with uh, this book, The Last Unicorn by uh, Peter Sawyer uh, Beige of um, of uh, 1968, uh, made more famous by the Jules, ba Jules Bass and um, Arthur Rankin Jr. movie of uh, 1982. Uh, this story gave a very important impulses to increase the popularity of unicorns on the one uh, hand, and also um, change their, the, the whole concept of the unicorn. For up to that point, uh, unicorns hadn't been depicted as individuals, but only as representatives of a species. While in case of uh, this story, the last unicorns, uh, the last unicorn is given an actual name, even though a name applied to this unicorn only after she's being transferred into a human, Lady Amaltea. And um, this uh, Lady Amaltea uh, also became a bit of an archetype of unicorns, depicted as very noble and super superior, but also as very, very much aware of their own superiority and therefore being uh, rather arrogant and unapproachable, which is an image uh, that has often been uh, used uh, for unicorns. And by now there are many associations which, uh, of, with unicorns and well, some unicorn depictions can be rather uh, kitschy, uh, even for the taste of most brownies, I would say. But um, they are, uh, but uh, same as in the Middle Ages, where when the unicorns were seen as both symbols for matrimony and uh, virginity, uh, unicorns as, um, have become have become symbols for quite a few uh, different. Um, things in our times as well. There are many ironical depictions of unicorns with unicorns being uh, fat but confident, so um, gi uh, giving some self-confidence to um, people. The unicorns have also become a symbol for the lesbian and uh, gay rights movement, partly because unicorns have been linked to rainbows. And um, the song Over the Rainbow from um, by, sung by Judy Garland has uh, also become a very important uh, symbol for the movement because Judy Garland was very uh, supportive of um, homosexual uh, people and um, pr uh, the Stonewall riots uh, broke out when um, there was a mourning party after uh, death and then the police uh, tried to stop it. Well, anyway, unicorns linked to rainbows and therefore unicorns have uh, become a symbol for the lesbian and uh, gay and uh, bi and trans uh, community as well. Then unicorns uh, have on the one hand uh, been uh, uh, shown as uh, well animals mostly for kids, but we all know that doesn't hold true because uh, unicorns are cool no matter what. And the thing about um, unicorns is that, uh, like I said, there are no ancient myths about unicorns. They have often been uh, depicted as a real life species. And that makes uh, unicorns particularly interesting for we are the people who are making up the mythos now. My Little Pony is basically giving stories to a species which didn't have so many stories beyond uh, species uh, up to that point, and suddenly unicorns become individuals. Of course, individuals with a very high um, marketing value too, that shouldn't be uh, totally uh, ignored. But um, in a sense, it is a rather encouraging thought that even though unicorns may not exist in real life, we are the ones to create the legend or we can create, uh, we can contribute uh, to the creation of the uh, legend. And I think most of us, many of us are doing their uh, part uh, in this. 
Okay, so to that effect, let's have a good time here. I'm almost a little terrified that uh, that um, I have some minutes left. Usually, I tend to overextend my time uh, when giving presentations, but um, now with the end of the presentation reached, I would be very happy to answer any questions you may have and that I may be able to answer. And in case I don't know the answer or cannot answer the question, I will, of course, admit so. Is also the literature um, or some of the literature I used, uh, though um, it's all in German or translations of the uh, original English uh, books. So, um, yeah. Question time. Do you have any questions? I'm going to check out the uh, chat, uh, the, wait, the panel chat while doing the presentation. I couldn't pay attention to that one. And I hope that I didn't miss any questions in between. So, are there any questions? <laughs> and then for... moment uh Panel room? Is it impossible to to write in the panel info room? I thought that was room for in which questions should be asked. Sorry, I'm a bit confused there at the moment. Questions for another no. Um, excuse me. If the uh, the um, the uh, or if one of the organizers is in the chat, uh, where should I um, go to uh, for questions uh, to be asked? Sorry, I didn't. Uh, I didn't uh, ask that before. Thank you. I was about to have it neural net stage. Okay. Yeah. Here I am. Sorry. I, sorry about the confusion uh, there. Um, and I see there are uh, several uh, questions. Um, is there such a thing as uh, an alicorn in mythology? Yes and no. The thing is, um, there are many depictions of winged unicorns, one of which I showed in the presentation. In that case, uh, a Chinese uh, sculpture of a uh, winged unicorn, but um, there is no real mythology about um, winged unicorns, same as uh, with uh, the uh, with the unicorns themselves, except of course in My Little Pony and in modern day uh, stories. But there are no ancient um, stories about uh, alicorns, and also the name alicorn is uh, basically the name given to winged unicorns by My Little Pony, while traditionally alicorn was uh, the, descri the name of the substance of the unicorn horn. Okay, what about unikitty and puppycorn? Um, are there other unicornified creatures in mythology? I am very sure there are. Uh, there may probably be... Um, also many modern day uh, creations. I don't, I, I must um, admit that I am unfamiliar with uh, the names Unikitty and Puppycorn. Uh, sounds to me like they are modern day creations. Uh, so I'm not a hundred percent certain. Oh, and um, sorry, I missed a question above. Um, have you come across anything about crystal ponies having some connection with history? Uh, none at all. I think they are totally, uh, total. Uh, My Little Pony uh, product. Also, um, as I mentioned, the um, 
unicorns in uh, middle uh, in the legends of the Middle Ages and antiquity uh, don't have any actual ma uh, magic other than purifying water with their horns, uh, but um, no crystal magic or uh, crystal ponies in that sense. I can, of course, not guarantee that there isn't anything uh, like it, but um, at least I haven't found anything in it in the sources and the books uh, which I read. So they may be a total uh, My Little Pony creation. Okay. Um... Then there's a question by Jemis. Uh, don't you think that today the amount of unicorns in the merchandise marketing, etc., cetera, de devolved uh, the symbol itself? Devolve? Uh, I'm, I'm very sorry, devolve. I need to check out that word. My English is sufficient, but sometimes I need to check. Uh, devolve, devolve. Do you mean devalue or devolve? If you mean, um, don't you think that the amount of uh, merchandise devalues unicorns? If that's the question, I think that depends on the view of uh, the beholder. I uh, think just because there is a lot of business related to it doesn't uh, mean that um, the, that there wouldn't be any creativity. For example, My Little Pony, of course, is... A lot of business. There's a lot of money uh, to be made uh, with uh, the um, My Little Pony merchandise. However, that doesn't stop people from getting very creative with their fan art, their fan fiction, etc. Therefore, I don't see the commercial aspect as uh, as, as evil uh, per se. There is a lot of stuff which I would never pay any money for. There's some stuff which personally I find rather kitschy i gave the example one example during the presentation but just because that's my point of view and uh, my uh, taste uh, doesn't uh, make it any less valuable to anyone who appreciates uh, that kind of uh, merchandise or stuff so uh, who am i uh, to um to decide what uh, would devalue it if people who uh, think um value uh, something Okay, then um, are there any native North American unicorns? What mythological creatures has uh, My Little Pony not covered that you would like to see? Well, the Hippolectrian, for example, that would be a very interesting uh, story with uh, Scootaloo involved. If they if Scootaloo encountered a Hippolectrian, you know, half rooster, half um, horse, that would be kind of interesting, though I wonder how they could uh, make this come across as uh, not ridiculous in a sense. And um, as for North American unicorns, um, well, basically the My Little Pony mythology, but uh, no Native American unicorns. The thing is, um, horses had been uh, extinguished in uh, North America before the uh, arrival of um, Europeans. There had been horses in North America, uh, but um, apparently they hadn't left uh, so much of an impression as to allow for any um, tra any oral traditions about stories about uh, them uh, among the Native Americans. So for all I know, there are no uh, Native American uh, unicorn legends. Okay, uh, North American horse myths would have to be pretty modern because horses weren't around until the Spanish. Yes, almost. The Spanish um, the, uh, expedition of uh, Francesco de Coronado in, uh, I think, the 1530s um, may, may, uh, basically brought the basis uh, for the North American Mustang uh, horses. However, there had been horses before, the Hegerman horse, I think, um, in uh, the Ice Age in North America. There have been fossils found in Idaho in particular. However, they had um, died out partly because of the end of the Ice Age, partly maybe because they had been hunted uh, for food, um, but there were no, uh, there are no real legends uh, by Native Americans that I'm aware of, of any uh, unicorns. Okay, um, like, like losing uh, the value. Yeah, I don't, um, the value. Uh, oh, okay, the question had been answered. Um, um, if all the mythological horse species uh, fought, who would win? Well, why should they fight? Ho harmony. Who would outfriend the other, basically? I have no real uh, answer to that because um, I have never fought a unicorn or a pegasus or an earth pony 
or um, Kelpie or a hippocampus or a hippolectrian or a hippogriff. And if I ever encountered one of them, I wouldn't try to fight uh, any of them and I would not try to make them fight among each other. But you can, of course, think of your own stories in which uh, this is different and uh, which animal, which of the different species you would uh, consider um, the one who would win. But then again, uh, it may, may be a bit of a futile attempt seeing how different representatives of the same species uh, can be. I think it makes a difference whether, uh, speaking of pegasi, for example, whether both biceps uh, takes part in a, uh, in a resting competition or uh, pegasus like, um, well, don't know, derpy. We all know derpy would win against uh, both biceps, uh, but yeah. <laughs> okay, are there any other questions? <laughs> Still some uh, minutes left. And well, in any case, uh, thank you all very much uh, for your attention and uh, for being there. I hope that everything I said uh, was understandable for I still come with a strong German accent, I'm afraid. I hope that every word I said was clear. And if uh, there were any parts which were difficult to understand, I will stay around. I will still be around so uh, more questions can be asked. But I think I should uh, soon clear uh, the room uh, so the next uh, panel can take place there. So, um, yeah, uh, thank you all very much. And I will stay around. And if you have more questions, I'm very happy to answer them or to admit if I can't answer them. <laughs> See you. Oh, wait, there's one more question, I think, that Bruce had. Thank you. You're, you're very welcome. Thank you very much for the positive feedback. <laughs> and see you around. <laughs>